A man from Ontario, Canada, recounts the time the internet ruined his childhood memories. My sister and I were around 10 and 11 years old when our family moved from the city of Toronto to a farmhouse many miles away. For us kids, it was a wonderful new life, playing in the fields, (laughs) the fresh air. The old farmhouse was spacious, two floors and a basement too. Uh, We didn't know as kids that the house was over 100 years old, but Our parents would remind us in our more rambunctious moments uh, to be careful about the antique furniture that came with the house. Every wooden door and floorboard creaked in the place, and yes, it had a dark old basement, and I think you can guess the next question. In fact, almost all of our family and friends, mostly the ones from the city, would always ask us, Is the place haunted? Uh, Do you have any ghosts? Yeah, well, it was kind of a creepy-looking old farmhouse, I guess, if you were to look at it that way. But we eventually developed a standard answer. Yes, but she's a friendly ghost. See, people would laugh as if it was a punchline. Others sometimes became sincerely curious and wanted to know just what exactly a friendly ghost did. But in fact, we weren't joking we had become convinced we had a benevolent spirit in the old farmhouse. The first time our family caught on to a helpful ghost phenomenon was during the rainy springtime weather. Uh, See, we'd take off our soaking wet shoes and leave them by the front door. The next morning, we'd find our shoes had been placed rather neatly upside down over top of the old metal grates where the central heating would funnel hot air up into the living room. I suppose some folks knew that trick if you happen to have similar central heating grates in your home, but we were kids and we never thought of that, and we assumed mom or dad was doing it. Well, it turned out mom and dad assumed we'd put our shoes there. And I can still to this day remembering mom explaining this strange thing with our shoes. Well, I don't know, maybe your ghost nanny did it. I remember once our mom was chastising us for not returning glasses to the kitchen. She'd say, I don't want to have to keep collecting them from your bedrooms, so you kids just bring them back downstairs when you're finished. The thing was, both my sister and I would simply wake up to find empty glasses on our nightstands. Now, glasses we never recalled seeing the night before, and we don't remember taking up to our room, so here again we blamed it on our friendly ghost. Actually, we'd already given her a nickname, Nanny. Maybe our ghost nanny just wanted us to have something to drink in the middle of the night in case we woke up thirsty. That reminds me of another time when my sister and I had been outside playing on the farm all day long. Uh, When we got back in, there was a bottle of milk from the fridge just sitting there on the stairs. Well, it was as if she wanted to make sure we got our daily nutrition needs. (laughs) I can remember the day my mom was convinced beyond any doubts we had a full-on helpful ghost lady. Uh, Mom had taken some sheets out of the dryer in the basement, but she'd left them in a pile on top of the machine. The next morning, my mom found those same sheets neatly folded and set on the living room sofa. I remember she said, well that settles it, because I know for a fact your father couldn't fold the sheet if his life depended on it. So that proves beyond a doubt Nanny is as real as it gets. And if those incidents weren't enough to convince us we had a maternal ghost, there was the undeniable sliding chair. Among the home's original furnishings was an antique wooden chair that came with the home. It was one of those antiques our father warned us not to use. It was a kind of stool, really, thick wooden legs and a wooden seat with a spoked backrest. Uh, We kept that at the back wall of the living room, 
and that living room was where us kids spent most of our evening hours, watching TV or sprawling toys or puzzles across those big wooden floorboards. That old chair against the back of the wall would move. It would slide ever so slowly closer and closer to us kids in the middle of the living room. This was no illusion. We saw the chair move, and by that time in our house, we were so accustomed to Nanny's ghostly activities, we'd joke about it. We'd say, oh, hi, Nana. You want to come sit with us now? Okay. And simply return back to whatever we were doing, watching TV or playing games. Some nights, the chair would skittle and slide the full 10 feet or so before coming to a stop right beside us. You'd think we'd be scared. I mean, to see a straight-up paranormal activity like that? But I would swear to anyone, we actually thought it was fun and even comforting. You know, if our parents were in the room, they'd play along too. Oh, here comes old Nanny. I guess she wants to sit with us. And sure enough, that chair would wobble, vibrate, and slowly slide along until it was right beside us like Nanny was a family member just wanting to sit with us. I mean, not that we could see her, but I think we imagined her ghostly form, surely that of a lovely old grandmother, just sitting in that chair. You know, this will even sound funny, but when we all went off to bed, we'd, we'd feel a little bad about putting the chair back against the wall. Uh, we'd say things like, Sorry, Nanny, time for bed now, but you can come visit us tomorrow as we'd place it up against the wall. Well, several years later, my sister and I were in our early teens by then, and our family moved again, this time from the big old farmhouse back to Toronto and condominium city living. I can remember when the moving truck was full and we said goodbye to the home for the last time, my little sister said out loud, Goodbye, Nanny. We'll miss you the most. And waved at the middle of the now empty living room, as if Nanny was somehow floating in midair. I'm telling you, we really felt like we were leaving her behind, and we really would miss her. At least, I'd miss her for a few decades. It'd been over 25 years since our family moved out of that farmhouse, and yet it held such fond memories that our family would always bring it up at every holiday get-together. See, I had a great idea for an upcoming Christmas gathering. I'd research that old farmhouse online, and if possible, whatever information I could get, I would dazzle everyone with a little history presentation. You know, the Internet provided a wealth of info, with the Farms County having recently uploaded a century of digitized files, old photos, local newspaper scans, all going back even to the 1930s. And it took a lot of clicks, but lo and behold, I found an article about the very farmhouse from March 1947. The Linden Home Tragedy was the headline. And below that glaring title was a grainy black and white photo of what was obviously to me our old family farm. In the photo, old style police cars were parked in front of the house. Well, of course, I started reading the article and I wish I never did. The story described the original occupants of the house, Mr. and Mrs. Gordon Linden, who had two children, and it reveals that Gordon died in World War II, leaving his wife a widow. The story goes on to suggest Mrs. Linden had developed melancholy after the death of her husband, and with the pressures of raising two children by herself, she descended into a state of madness. This, the author of the story, had it would surely explain how she came to, oh, what's this, to murder her own children and then end her own life shortly thereafter. I kept clicking. Now further issues of the local newspaper 
uh, would follow up on the Linden tragedy with some of the terrible conclusions of investigators. How that day must have been like any other, the children coming home from school on a rainy spring day. It was supposed that she had pre-planned everything as they found poison had been measured out in the kitchen where it was mixed into glasses of warm milk that she would give the children before bed. A grainy black and white photo showed the empty glasses found on the children's nightstands. On the opposing page, a photo of the living room. Now that's the same living room my family would later have enjoyed our evenings in. The beam from which she hanged herself was the caption. Well, I recognize that wooden beam. That was the living room. Sure, I, I recognize that, but what really jolted me was there in the photo that that chair, the one we called Nanny's chair. You know, without a doubt, it was the same chair, but in the story, it's describing a grisly purpose. It says, After tying sheets from the beam to her neck, the widow kicked the chair out from under her, thus hanging herself to death. Indeed, I looked carefully at the old photo. I tried to zoom in. The toppled chair, well, where she would have hung, was just about bang on where we, years later, would have sat and played and watched TV right there in the center of the living room. And that's where that damn chair was aiming for every night it started moving on its own. Nanny Linden was never a friendly ghost. She wasn't a helpful ghost. No, the entire time, she was a malicious, child-murdering, psychotic ghost who, I think all along, was just replaying the madness over and over again, but maybe with us children as our new would-be victims. I never shared my discovery with family that Christmas or any other time. It's been brought up again, those good old days, the farm life days. Uh, that big old house and, you know, my mom always would chirp in something like, Don't forget we had a ghost nanny too. And everyone would smile. I think they'd best not know what she was up to that entire time. So I'll keep it to myself. But yeah, that's how my childhood memories were ruined. Maybe sometimes ignorance really is bliss, and that applies to ghosts and memories too.